The wayfinding landscape is changing, so welcome to Endpoint's Wayfinding Exchange podcast. We want to connect with leading experts, tech innovators, and key contributors to exchange knowledge and innovation in physical and digital wayfinding. We want to shape the future of wayfinding through discussion, collaboration, and shared expertise. And this is why we have created this podcast series. Enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome back to the Wayfinding Exchange podcast. Uh, Today we have a very special guest indeed, someone who when I asked our own studio for ideas and to get on the podcast was the resounding winner. So I'd like to welcome Jason Bruges of Jason Bruges Studio. For those of you who don't know Jason Bruges Studio, they're an internationally renowned for producing innovative installations, interventions and groundbreaking artworks. I think the practice sits somewhere between the world of architecture, site-specific installation art and interaction design. And I'd encourage uh, all of you to go and visit jasonbruges.com and check out some of their amazing and wonderful projects. Other platitudes, I think, considered a pioneer in this hybrid space and sort of paved the way for a new type of design studio, artist, designer, maker. Is that that true? I think it's quite a unique proposition. Yeah, I think it's it's quite hard to say in one word. Yeah, so sometimes... A triptych of phrases helps. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, just just to get things going, I mean, it might be a a silly question, but, you know, do you you consider yourself an artist or a designer, both, or are labels irrelevant? I think in some ways the labels are very fluid, but also in some ways they're useful because at some any point in time someone needs to know how to relate to you whether it's creatively professionally as a peer probably in most of our clients and commissioners eyes I'm an artist or the studio is an art studio with me leading that studio we create work and we're commissioned to create work for those clients or commissioners and we use design to develop and experiment and realise work. And that's an incredibly important part of what the studio is. But I suppose the sort of starting point is very experimental. So it doesn't often, we're not sitting there saying, oh, are we answering a brief and is this incredibly functional? It might be we're experimenting with something a little bit more intangible, I suppose. But it wouldn't happen without design. It wouldn't happen without engineering. It wouldn't happen without science. It wouldn't happen without art. So all of those things are implicit in what the studio is doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think the three things you said, I mean, the, the kind of art, I suppose, is is the practice in a way. It, it's an artistic practice. Um, people aren't coming to us and say, please design a laptop. Um, they're coming to us to perhaps create an atmosphere in which use a laptop. They are expecting quite often a process um, of experimentation, testing, prototyping. The studio feels a bit like a lab or a workshop. People are accustomed to um, picking up a sketchbook, but equally tinkering with some piece of electronics or some kind of hack of things or melded Mm -hmm. together in order to test an idea out. So in those ways, it probably looks looks unusual. So yes, the the different terms are banded about. And yes, I do feel a little bit like a chameleon at times because I will be an artist, but if someone wants me to be a designer, I'll be a designer. I'm not not precious myself. I'm more interested in the work and the process and the things we're exploring than the label given to that work. But I do enjoy the conversation around that, but it's not the be all and end all to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we'll get into the the process and and the uh, studio in, in a little while. Uh, I'm sure people who listen to this podcast will be going, What's the, <laughs> where's the wayfinding relevance? But at the, you know, at the end of the day, for us, wayfinding is about, you know, it's that experience of, of place. And I think that's exactly what, what you're about. It's that person's experience of place. And, and for us, we're having more and more conversations about either working with their artist of choice or getting involved in some of those placemaking interventions. And it's um, much easier working with someone who knows exactly what they're doing in that in, in, in that space. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, interestingly, more and more commissions we're getting are part of 
wayfinding strategies or city-wide strategies and either we're weaving into a sort of public art master plan, we're weaving into a wayfinding master plan, we're weaving into a master plan. And more and more often we're incumbent or embedded into teams which are looking at that sort of thing, which is kind of really great. And from day one as well. So, you know, the ability to sort of be part of a team like that and say, look, our kind of work can sit in the context of this space mm-hmm. because of X and it increases permeability or it will help people understand this or it will help build a theme that's this, you know, we have lots of conversations at a sort of quite high level very early on. So we're getting imported <laughs> into teams more and more often, but also early on as well, which is really good and having sort of conceptual conversations about a sort of backbone of a place, which is really, really good. And it's good to see that that's kind of valued. And From reading uh, in preparation for the interview, you started out as an architect, you studied architecture. What was that journey and what was that transition from, you know, sort of pragmatic architect into superstar artist? So I started very much as, as an artist. Um, my mother trained to be an artist and I was surrounded by a few other artists in the family. That was always a a hobby really not so much I was taught school I was building sketching making things as much building things that worked as as well as actually drawing to understand how to build or make things but equally my father was a computer scientist a software engineer so I was already surrounded by a bit of science and engineering that was also happening in the background so those two things affected me but architecture seemed like this sort of logical place where I could work in between the sciences and the physics and the things I really enjoyed, like my favourite subject at A-level was physics. So, you know, and I did incredibly well at that and understood it and really got excited by the physics, pure and applied maths that went with it. But then you'd find me in the workshop at the same time and I'd be using my physics and the, or some of the electronics. Even at A-level, I was doing, I was equally at home in the workshop as I was in the physics lab. So... There was an interesting kind of interplay between those two things. I was no longer actually studying art at the time at school, but architecture seemed to be this sort of applied art, this sort of technical applied art that that sort of fulfilled to my interests. And I'd designed some building exteriors by that point in time, but nothing really akin to an architectural portfolio. Never worked for an architect. So straight into an architecture degree at Oxford Brooks and it was really fascinating. It was a very broad church of kind of architecture in what it was about. We were encouraged to create installations that were experiential. We were encouraged to build one-to-one performance spaces. We were encouraged to look at structures. We were encouraged to look at extreme environments. We were encouraged to look at environmental psychology. We were encouraged to be artists. So all of that coming together and thinking about buildings was, was you know, something kind of really interesting. And so my final projects, even in my degree, were experiential performative installations and went off into the world of architecture after that. I worked for Norman Foster in Hong Kong, straight into working on the, some of the terminals at the uh, new Hong Kong airport. And off the back of that, came back to the Bartlett at UCL under Peter Cook, whose sort of... Um, Vision around architecture was fascinating. It was very much about performance, very much about behavior, very much about emotion and buildings that could perform, move, dance, okay. sing. You know, a building was not this sort of frozen thing. And also he was very, very experimental. So, you know, coming out of that world of archigram and, you know, buildings almost being quite robotic and performative um, and looking at people like Cedric Price and looking at kind of things that very much were alive. Mm-hmm. I was involved with a unit there that, that um, which I also taught on uh, and advised in, into its new MA sort of format, really. Um, it was all about interactive architecture, um, performative architecture, architecture that could come alive. Um, and that's really seeded and really firmly planted, I suppose, the backdrop for, 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 for the studio's work and for my interests, this, this idea of a space, this idea of an artwork, this idea of a kind of environment that will change based on things that are happening around it. This idea of performative work, this idea of interactive work, this idea of dynamic work that's that's there to entertain, that's there to please, that's there to kind of provoke, that's there to enjoy, um, to create wonder, to create um, something that sort of is a, is a catalyst for conversation. 
something that, that's going to get people talking about kind of real life problems, real life things, but in a site specific contextual way. So what was there, because it sounds like you were pretty deep into a architectural career doing an MA. Was there a, a specific point in time when you thought, you know, I'm not going to be spending my life on an AutoCAD terminal doing schedules and I'd rather be doing what you're doing now? Was, was there a point in time? Yeah, no, it's, it is interesting. I carried on working for Norman Foster in London and his team there and amazing projects, amazing work, amazing um, experience and still collaborate with Norman and his various teams there on projects. So it's been an ongoing relationship. But I was then working for Imagination, who was sort of senior designer there. And it was very much about more performative, more temporary, getting to that world of experiential design, getting that world of brand design and really, really kind of fascinating. And just the theatricality of how to pitch and how to create work was really interested and that that kind of spam me off in another direction of a really understanding about how to work in a slightly different way and b it gave me a kind of outlet for some of that work i've been doing in my studies which was very much about this performative architecture this architect that comes alive and here was an environment i was encouraged to do that for the first time professionally and i was seeing an outlet for it and then alongside that started to note these competitions that were for projects in the public realm so for public artworks and very much kind of the early 2000s, there was a rising and upsurgence of kind of opportunities in the public realm of people well, wanting to create work that, that, that talked to the audience, that kind of really engaged people. But we'll start to use technology, light, sound, as, as it was coined at the time, multimedia, I suppose, I suppose really mixed media. Um, and, and kind of creating these sort of rich media environments in the public realm. And I started getting engaged by these competitions, but from my background of designing in a site-specific way, contextually, but in a way as this is what it is, this is the idea, but this is how you build it. It was, I think, very compelling for people. And I managed to get work commissioned. It took about three years of doing that to actually start getting commissioned to, to build these big pieces of work that the people are investing money in when they've never seen like an animated dashboard next to a road before. And I'm sort of saying, well, this sort of piece of work could be created. And this isn't like some little display. It's 12 meters high and it's, wow. it's like mounted on some sort of screw piles on, on an elevated roadway next to the A13. And you know, you're kind of having to convince traffic engineers that a piece of artwork like this is okay. And, and it's buildable and all the rest of it. And, 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 and it's going to have longevity and it's going to last 20 years and, all these sorts of things. Anyway, obviously, with my architecture hat on, my engineering and science hat on, but my kind of fascination with this type of work enabled me to start building a studio and starting persuading people that this kind of work was feasible, really, I suppose. Excite them, but persuade people to do it because, you know, it was work people hadn't really seen, certainly not outside some of the more avant-garde galleries. And obviously, you'd pick up these sorts of pieces of work in different sorts of galleries in small scale but but to sort of put that outside and say that's the last 20 years and it's not going to make anyone crash and, but it's still about something kind of interesting scientifically artistically i mean it's you know that's pretty courageous you know starting out with a fairly formal architectural training but yeah you know, i guess being drawn to this more experiential like you say performance side of it so did you set up jason bruges and then it was three years before you got a commission or were you, uh, were you doing other things? Yeah, I mean, I started practicing and I think it was about a year informally. And then you started to realize that the things you needed to drop into place. You became fat registered, <laughs> you set up your name, you started to hire people. That's slowly yeah. things were kind of like, okay, this isn't just me in my bedroom, like working as a freelancer. I was breaching every threshold there was for sort of making money and doing things. So suddenly, you know, you realize, okay, I need to be this, I need to be that, I need to be this, I actually need an office. All those sorts of things were quite were quite kind of, I hadn't, hadn't realised that was going to happen and all that quickly, and it did. But it was, I think, from the moment in time I started doing this, and there was probably a bit of a grey area where there's an overlap with other work and things, but it was probably three years where I started creating pieces of work under my own name, post actually doing any kind of studies or research work. About three years from the first temporary works right through to the, having the first thing built, I suppose. So there's a lot of trust in that three-year period of, like, I can create something that's going to stand the test of time, stand up, 
and create the kind of effect, the outcome and the manifestation and the atmospheric kind of conditions and the things I was interested in. You know, I think every, every entrepreneur or, you know, every business owner has took that plunge, you know, done the things that you've mentioned and have to get all those uh, boring bits in place. I mean, what, what, what was that point when you thought, yes, this is a good idea, this is going to happen and this is going to be my, my future? Was there a, a certain commission or a certain client that gave you that belief or it was just that iterative organic process to get to where you are now? In that period, there was there was a few commissions that didn't happen for various reasons, not out of my control. One, I was working on a quite an interesting media installation for a private members club in central London. And I think they just had a change of management and it got lost along the way. And I think I was doing some work for a telecoms company and I'm not, the telecoms company doesn't even exist anymore. And that didn't happen. And then there was a couple of things at the same time. Then there was the work I alluded to called Litmus, which still exists on the A13 series of... Um, Big totemic markers that mark the landscape that talk, they're almost a live sculptural data visualizations, but they're like, you know, they're 20, 22 years old now, 21 years old. That commission really sort of was quite seminal, but it was getting something built and creating some piece of work. It definitely got people, got people things noticed. And then there was also a piece of work I created for the Puerto America Hotel in Madrid and they called it the Tide Memory Wall. And it was a piece of work that was working alongside Yoshida Finlay, so Catherine, the late Catherine Finlay. And there was an architect per floor. So that this building was a bit akin to the United Nations, which had many architects working on it. But it was like at least 20 architects working on it. Ron Arad, Norman Foster, Mark Newson, Jean Nouvel, Zardi. Fascinating dinner conversations, I have to say, with all these people around the table. And managed to get in with Catherine working on this one floor, the eighth floor of the hotel. Each footprint of each floor was the same. And she was introduced. We had, I think, mutual friends, mutual collaborators. And we were introduced and she said, oh, brilliant. And he was doing all this sort of very curvaceous stuff, slightly Zara-esque, but slightly more to do with biological kind of forms and things. And we decided, I think, all the public spaces could be dynamic and interactive and responding to the sort of comings and goings. And I was sort of suggesting that this interior could be like fashion, basically. We wear different colour clothes in different sort of months of the year. Trendsetters decide what dyes and yarns and fabrics are going to be in situ probably two years in advance. People don't often realise that. It's all very much set in stone. And I thought, well, what if the interior can respond to that? So I sort of created this system that filmed what people were wearing and the interior copied it and followed it. And now you wouldn't blink an eyelid if you saw something like that. But this was one of the world's first video controlled interiors, as far as I know, that we created for that hotel. But the idea of that and this sort of environment looks so space age, so out there, so new, that, that it was quite incredible, A, to have pulled it off and worked on it. But I just remember being sat there on a, they, they had quite a good PR setup. They had all the architects. So representatives of, and some of the people I've just mentioned, all on this massive long table. And I think Catherine, bless her, couldn't attend for whatever reason. So I was up there as a sort of representative, sitting there going, yeah, this might be going somewhere. <laughs> you know, and you're kind of at this little tipping point where projects like that really did kind of, cement the way forward and I think there was another moment like that I think that 2009 there was a competition to create artworks for the new Olympic Park in in, in Stratford and pitched out of obviously hundreds of people wanting to do that job in London um, artists designers architects all sorts of people you know really high profile public artwork and I think the first two commissions went to my studio and Martin Richmond the artist so again another situation where we won this first kind of Olympic Park Art Commission in London for the Olympic Delivery Authority. And weirdly, it was one of those weird bits of the sort of fabric of that whole park where we could talk about it from day one. For some reason, the artists were not under the same quite extraordinary restrictions of or, or, or all the other designers and things. And it was part of the sort of cultural fabric. So it was talked about. But that sort of thing, you know, and when you start to go on that journey, and we've had subsequent Olympic commissions from, you know, in Tokyo and other places. So, you know, these little moments you start to go, oh, wow, this is another little very interesting sort of genre of work or place to be commissioned within, really. And, and you sort of feel very excited about and that you've worked hard, but, you know, at the same time, 
there's a bit of recognition for you know pitching for work like that and a lot of the work does involve pitching and and being part of that process is there always i know a lot of graphic designers don't like admitting that they have a style even though you can often tell whose works who's just by looking at it but it, i mean would, how would you categorize your work is it is there always this idea of movement and performance is there always a technological digital element to your work is it, are those fundamental things that you you get in when you you commission jason bruges there is a lot of things that will crop up again and again not always at the same time but quite often concurrently so site specificness is pretty key we're looking at the sort of genius loci the atmosphere of a place the sort of climate the socioeconomics the history the, all, all the sort of architectural things you look at as well the kind of vistas the sight lines the composition of space massing and that is all interrogated you know on site geographically from satellites from word of mouth all thought about how does a piece of work sit here in this space quite often it might be integrated so therefore you're embedded potentially in a professional team so that in itself is quite unusual I mean, the level, I think, of critique that is happening with respect to the context. That's one thing. The palette, I would say, well, two parts of the palette, as I just said, the canvas is, I never like using this word, but is the built environment, it is the artificial environment, it is the constructed environment around a piece or partially natural environment. It is quite often... There's an element of applied technology or technological systems within it. And in a kind of strict artistic sense, it's described as sort of mixed media, but where the media might involve sound, light, haptics, robotics, technical systems, and all sorts of other things. I got interested in um, performative systems, um, composite materials. So there's quite a wide range of interests within that. But they're all very much... They, they kind of kind of stems, I think, from an interest in creating pieces of work that explore and approximate the living. So things that are deemed to be living. So there's that element of performance. There's that element of magic. That's the element of suspension or of disbelief that, that gives you a, something that, that appears alive and, right. and, and animated and interactive and reactive and and essentially living really, something that's sort of really kind of coming to life, that, that will give joy, will give a sense of wonder, and sometimes is either alleviating, might be alleviating anxiety or promoting an opportunity for kind of wellness or healing, because our work appears in hospitals as well. So you know, right from entertaining, that entertainment could be turned into something that's alleviating a, 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 sort of a more negative situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amazing. I can't remember what I started, but that's... Yeah. No, no, that's... Yeah, I, I feel... I think my, my description is a little bit crude. <laughs> but as you say, but within all that, there is a style, and every time... I mean, I'm sort of a bit of a minimalist, weirdly, as well. So things are stripped down to kind of what they need to be. I don't add lots of things for the sake of adding them. And, and when you're trying to build a system that animates and performs, you don't, don't need much. I mean, at the end of the day, you, if it's digital, all you need really is a screen. But I'm not really interested in screens. They're very flat. They're very planar. Mm -hmm. They're not, there's a place and time for them, get me wrong. But I quite like exploring how, how is that screen spatialized? How is it manifested? What's it made from? You know, how does it embed into its environment? Um, so there's quite a lot of biomimicry in there as well, because I'll be looking at sort of animals that sort of change their colours and, and like, you know, be looking at a squid or a chameleon or a bird's plumage or or even looking at, you know, by looking at things that pattern, that animate like clouds in the sky or or, or, or kind of water is in a bit of an obsession as well, as, as are lots of other natural phenomena. Interesting. Going back to the, I guess, the timeline a little bit. So, you know, we're fast-forwarding... 20 years? Did you set up in 2002? So, yeah, 20, 21 years. 2002, 2001, unofficially. So it's sort of been 21, 22 years, depending on when you exactly kind of draw a line in the sand. So tell us about the studio life now, the culture of Jason Bruce Studio. I know you've alluded to, to some of it already. Yeah. How, how many people do you employ? How many projects are you working on at any one time? What's, what's a day in the life like? So we try and, I mean, 
in this time in the world, we try and get people in the studio, 26, 27 people in the studio full time, all different walks of life, um, interests, disciplines, very multidisciplinary, very diverse. I mean, the two key skills really probably are, are the sort of creative and very curious aspect of people developing work and ideas and presenting those and, and driving those ideas forward. And then probably around the technology and the production thereof. So the sort of two camps and, and all the people that support that. So probably three camps. I, I suspect you do. And reading from your website, there's labs and there's people experimenting and doing research. Is that all in response to projects or briefs or is it Google-esque and people are allowed to experiment and do things like when, when they're not working on projects, how, how does it work? How does that work? Well, it's interesting. I have to say, so um, it, historically, the work has been very much led by commission. Projects are quite big and there's quite a lot of research around projects. So generally speaking, that's allowed for quite a lot of freedom, quite a lot of experimentation. People can learn new things within their roles. So that that's worked pretty well. But I am starting now to look at where we do our own research that leads sort of future work, but also leads possible kind of opportunities for projects we generate, but also around education and, and providence around what we're doing. So it is an area I'm interested in. It is an area of growth, I think. And, and certainly I think people are interested in the research we're doing. And in terms of sort of strict classification of research, I think last time I looked, about 80% of our projects are deemed as research projects in terms of sort of, you know, taxation and all that sort of thing. So we're doing first-in-class research into software, materials, composites, systems, algorithms, um, which is exciting, really. As, as someone who is an artist, delving into kind of algorithms, delving into AI, delving into composites, delving into kind of various sort of systems and mathematics is you know quite exciting mm -hmm, amazing we've collaborated with technology companies recently we collaborated on an ai with deepmind google deepmind and mm -hmm. you know to be collaborating with people like that co-authoring work is very exciting mm, amazing i've just likened it to our, our studio here do you do you design and build all of your installations or are sometimes you commissioned just to design only and you manage people to, to build or, or do you insist that everything you design you have to build because you've got more control then? How, how, how does how's that work? I mean, largely, I think insist is probably slightly strong, but we're very keen to be a large part of the production, fabrication, installation process of a piece of work. And obviously, it sort of depends on the scale, like... At the end of the day, a lot of the time we're given the responsibility for procuring and delivering work, but how much is literally being assembled and built and tested in the studio versus how much we're outsourcing and collaborating with companies that are experts in installation, cladding, metalwork, and other things. But various things we never get up, like the, the brain for an artwork, that sits with us always. So hardware, software, firmware, algorithms content animations generative animations and algorithms all sits within the studio and for me when people start to say they don't want sole supply given to us for any of those kind of components for me it's a bit akin to a painter outsourcing their painting of their painting you know they might buy the paint they might get someone to build the canvas for them but they are going to decide where the paint gets put and that's what mm -hmm. the kind of software is really at the end of the day it's it's something that's deciding how a malleable, dynamic, changing, generative canvas is going to change and what the rules are for doing that. And that you want to be in control of the brain. That, that's the main thing. And we had that on a few projects, particularly like large infrastructure projects where everything, absolutely everything is sort of outsourced or tendered. And fair enough, it's part of the process. But, you know, we're saying, well, we cannot tender the painting of this painting it can't that that is impossible so i've had that funny conversation a few times yeah that brings me on to how do you price a project you, you mentioned earlier about you know most projects you pitch for so do most projects come with a, a budget in mind or do you price first for the the brain bit and then it's whatever the production is later if you're a client wanting to 
commission Jason Bruges, how, how should they go about procuring you, I guess? I mean, there's a whole number of ways. Some people just want to know what the price is for everything. And, you know, we want to see something finished on this wall, integrated into our building, whatever it is. And they've either been given a price by someone that knows about things like that, and they've got a budget in mind, or they might have a very kind of um, experienced quantity surveyor that, that knows about media artworks. Where do you find them? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, on cultural projects, you know, it's happening, happens more and more, or, 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 you know, projects that use certain sorts of technologies or a certain amount of um, certain types of engineering or fabrication. Or, yeah, you, you might be commissioned to sort of come up with some ideas and it's very much stage-based and then you get to a point where you're asked to sort of pitch for the building of it. And it's happened every way, really. I mean, yeah. but more often than not, we will supply a price for the thinking about it and the design and development of the idea. And then we'll supply a price for the production, fabrication, assembly and installation and the aftercare as well. I was going to mention that. I mean, you, you, you said that the, the work on the A13 is still there. I mean, are you also responsible for maintenance? Do, do a lot of your jobs as part of the commission, you know, they know it's going to have a, a length of life. It, it's not forever. Again, I guess it all depends, but is there a trend there? So um, at the end of the day, it's actually getting more important, I'm glad to say, that people are asking the two things people want to know at the end of the day. They go, great work, we love it, we'd love something like this in the scheme we're thinking about at the moment. And they might be a developer, they might be a cultural placemaking person from a city, they might be a commissioner. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, what's the cost? What's the investment here? And, and Jason, how does this technology work? What happens when it breaks, basically? The two things. And, you know, we have enough expertise around building pieces that we can say plus or minus 10% within the first sort of stages we can sort of say the sort of level of investment required level of cost and then also we get into the well if you want you can engage us to maintain work or at least be on a end of a phone and or monitor the artwork via internet we can do remote device management we can look at things all over the world and see how they're progressing and the more and more things we build the more we're getting used to how long things last but obviously, the more and more we're getting into conversations about decommissioning or recommissioning or repurposing and refurbishing and all sorts of things, which is great. We design for things to have a long life. I mean, we talk 20 years, we talk 50 years, and this is even things with digital componentry and modules. So we're very much both in terms of style, aesthetics, technology. We're creating work that's about itself, that references itself, that's contextual, that's timeless, that's elegant, that works and will carry on working. And, and, and we're getting approached a lot and at the moment, actually, for our works to be recommissioned and, and kept in as good, or, good order as they were on day one, mm -hmm. um, which is great, really, to know that people are seeing the value of keeping this work going and what this work has contributed to place. And do you think, I mean, are people collecting your work now? I mean, is there a... Is there an artistic value to your work now? Should should we be going out buying decommissioned um, Jason Bruges pieces? Well, I think there'd be a value in doing that. There's definitely there. I mean, it's work that's recognised within a few, quite a few fields. And um, whilst the work is largely commissioned by quite large commissioners, i.e., not individuals, um, so there's not a massive market because it's museums, it's cities, it's developers that kind of own this work, big corporations, big companies. But nevertheless, you know, we're, we're thinking more and more about what will this work do after it's been there or could someone sell it and all the rest of it. So what, it is a case of watching this space, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many questions I'd like to delve into. We, we probably just don't have time. But I mean, talking of the future, obviously... Built environment, uh, you know, every RFP we get now, there's a massive sustainability element. I mean, how do you, you know, how, how has your work evolved over the years? And, you know, how do you see sustainability playing a role in your work? So, I mean, it sort of takes me back to when I was first training to be an architect. I mean, I still remember my lecturer in Oxford. You know, we we're doing calculations about how many solar panels we'd need and looking at sort of intelligent building systems and looking at how grey water would be recycled. We were looking at heat pumps. 
And this is a very long time ago. Um, and at that point in time, I just felt, well, surely that sort of thing should be integral to a building. And, and actually some of the early projects we did and, and one, but didn't build were around wind turbines. And we've done a few explorations around wind turbines, both looking at sort of media systems on them. We might be working on a very large wind turbine project at the moment, but the, the sort of subject matter around, I suppose, the more obvious technologies. But I think there's so many more things that we can talk about. We've worked with a lot of charities over the years. We work for Greenpeace. We work for the World Wildlife Fund. We've worked for many others, and a lot of which has been Thames 21 recently looking at the water quality in the River Thames. And it's all about environment, all about protecting and or just revering the environment that surrounds us mm -hmm. and celebrating it. And with that, making people kind of engage with it and think about it. And a lot of the work has been about that. It's been about work that, that sort of is about biophilia, biomimicry, sort of approximating or, or, or kind of showing off the natural world that sits around us. And I suppose a very subtle, perhaps a too subtle hint to kind of take charge and look after it, really. But now we are, I think we're nine months into our Court B kind of application, okay. which looks at all areas of ESG. So really now, I've you know, 20 years in, we've, we've you know, I've started saying, well, I've always been about a lot of these things. I've always looked at how the environment is essentially talked about, how it is revered, how it is protected and always been inspired by it. But now it feels like the time is to sort of put the practice into a position of sort of helping more kind of proactive way, really. So, yeah, there's lots, lots happening behind the scenes um, in the studio. And, and we've always been mindful and careful about how we consume and as i say longevity of work is something that kind of i've always been passionate about i things not being thrown away and things being kept used for as long as possible and the right to repair around things all these sorts of things layered into the work and the types of manufacturing so yes but i suppose being a bit more proactive and a bit more obvious around that and not just because it's very very fashionable because it's something that i've always cared about and wanted to support and for, for lots of reasons is so much more important now. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, similar situation. I remember when I was at university doing life cycle analysis of different materials and products, and um, it seems like the world's catching catching up now. It's just, it just seems like some of this, it, this, this sort of work, it, it's expensive, um, you, you've got your whole ecosystem's got to catch up, but up and downstream. And, you know, everyone's been on side at the end of the day. It, commissions cost more if they're designed properly, unfortunately, um, which involves some proper investigation and, and some science and some extra knowledge quite often. And that's all really worth building up. Well, you certainly committed if you um, if you go for your corp, be accreditation it's uh it's no mean feat is it apparently not <laughs> <laughs> well look i mean we, we should probably end it there it's been super fascinating thank you so much for your time it's been it's been amazing if anybody wants to get in contact it's jason bruges b-r-u-g-e-s dot com as in the city dot com and yeah we're, we're always very very welcoming to kind of Lines of inquiry in terms of we want to collaborate, we want to find out more. Always happy to have a conversation over a coffee in the studio. Uh, people kind of make an appointment to come and see us, and you know we'd welcome you you to come and see us. And and we have lots of prototypes. We have this sort of lab environment, and and find it the best way really to sort of engage with what we do. We're also very open and interested uh, to find out about other projects speculatively and chat to people large part of the sort of practice is about collaboration and but also embedding ourselves into other teams and yeah i've enjoyed the conversation and thank you for your time gideon it's been a lot of fun reminiscing and i would love to carry on but equally i'm sure you've got a lot more time. <laughs> yeah yeah no there's lots to do but i mean i can confirm you know we yeah when we started this when we reached out to you about the um uh, potentially doing this Two or three of our guys were invited to your studio. I unfortunately couldn't make it, so I should be coming along at some other time for that coffee. Brilliant. 
Well, you'd be very welcome. <laughs> Brilliant. Super. Thanks very much. Well, no, no problem at all. Um, if any questions arise from this conversation, do get in touch with myself or Gideon. Thank you for listening to our latest Wayfinding Exchange podcast. Stay tuned for further episodes and feel free to contact us with any questions and suggestions for future episodes.